Welsh mythology is a comparative unknown when compared to bigger names in Celtic mythology, to the point where I kind of forgot to mention it in my earlier videos on the subject. Sorry, Wales baby, it won't happen again. When Celtic mythology is on the table, Scotland and Ireland are generally thought to be the big contributors, with Breton and Cornish mythology providing some of the wackier mythical creatures, like the Anku and Corrigan, as well as the fairy tale classics like giants and mermaids. Welsh mythology didn't have as much overlap with the other Celtic contributors, but it did have a mythology of its own, much of it being famously codified in the four-part Mabinogi. So today we're going to be talking about the first part of the Mabinogi, specifically the exploits of Push, Prince of Devet. And before you ask, no, I can't pronounce these names any better than I can pronounce Irish names. Sorry. So Push is out hunting one day when he winds up getting separated from his hunting party and finds himself lost. Not one to stop the party just because he's lost and alone on the misty moorland, Push instead focuses on some strange dogs he notices harrying a deer, and sends his own dogs to drive them away so he can catch it instead. But as it turns out, these dogs belong to Araun, King of Anwin, the Welsh mythological Otherworld, which as it turns out is where they are right now. Don't ask how Push managed to get so lost that he ended up in fairyland, I'm sure he couldn't tell you. So Araun is mildly pissed about the dog thing, but says Push can make it up to him if he helps him out with a little problem he has. See, Araun is technically only king of half of Anwin. The other half belongs to this dude Havgan, and they don't really get along. The last time they fought, Araun took down Havgan, but Havgan tricked him into whacking him a second time, which let Havgan magically heal all his injuries. They're scheduled to fight in one year's time, so Araun wants Push to take his place in the battle and defeat Havgan in a single strike. Push is totally cool with this, as he apparently is with most things, so Araun disguises them as each other and sends Push off to rule his kingdom for a year. Push heads to the court, acclimates quickly, and has the time of his life partying it up and ruling the kingdom. The food is great, the environment is fun, and best of all, Aran's wife is a beautiful and interesting lady who's loads of fun to talk to. Long story short, Push has a blast spending his year ruling the kingdom until fight time rolls around, when he heads off to the battlefield to do Havgan one-on-one. -on -one. They have a pretty nifty duel, and Push gets in a solid hit, at which point Havgan goes all, oh, I am slain, won't you finish me off? And Push is like, nah, and heads off to conquer the other half of Anwin. Then Push meets back up with Aran, who strips the illusions off and sends him back home. Push is stoked to find that his kingdom has flourished in his absence under Aran's rule, and he explains to his court what exactly happened and what he's really been up to for the past year. Aran, meanwhile, returns home, relaxes, then goes to bed with his wife, who's surprised at him and explains her confusion by telling him that he hasn't even looked at her in bed for a year. Aran is stunned by Push's total bro move of not sleeping with his wife when he had the chance, and it's a happy ending for everybody. <laughs> So that's how Push made friends with the king of the other world. His next major achievement is getting married. You'd think this wouldn't be nearly as complex or time consuming, but you'd be wrong. See, Push hears about this hill where if you sit on it, you either get grievously injured or you see a miracle. Push ain't afraid of no grievous bodily harm, so he plops his butt down on the hill and immediately sees a beautiful woman riding a white horse. Push's enterprising subjects immediately take off after her, but apparently her horse works by horror movie logic because even though she's just at a casual trot, none of Push's men can catch up with her. Push saddles up to chase her down himself, but finds himself in the same boat as his subjects and runs his horse to exhaustion before he thinks to ask the lady if she'd maybe mind slowing down a little. So the lady in question introduces herself as Rhiannon, and she says she's come to find Push because she'd like to marry him. See, she's been betrothed to this guy she's not a big fan of, but she'd much rather marry Push, who, apparently dazzled by Rhiannon's nice dress and incredible horse riding skills, decides he wants to marry her too. Well, that was easy. Well, not quite. Rhiannon and Push arrange to be married a year later, but when the day arrives, their fancy party is crashed by a stranger, who introduces himself as a petitioner and asks Push for a boon. Push says, sure, anything, and as Rhiannon facepalms in the background, the stranger demands that Push give him Rhiannon as well as the party fixings and the feast. So yeah, turns out the petitioner is Gwawl, son of Cleed, aka Rhiannon's former fiance. Unfortunately, Push is honor bound to honor his request and give her up, but Rhiannon's prepared for this occasion and surreptitiously gives Push a plan to let him fix this mess. So one year later, Rhiannon and Gwawl are all set to be married when Push appears in disguise as a humble peasant, with nothing but an empty bag and a request. Gwawl, learning from history, says sure, anything, within reason, and Push simply requests that he be allowed to fill his sack with food. This suspiciously reasonable request is honored, and Push begins dumping food into the bag. But something's funny about this bag. No matter how much food he dumps into it, it doesn't get any fuller. In desperation to save his party, Gwawl asks what it would take to fill the bag, and Push innocently replies that he's sorry he forgot to mention it earlier, but the bag will only be full if a nobleman steps into it and tells it to knock it off. So as Rhiannon stifles a giggle in the background, Gwawl steps into the bag, and Push immediately shoves him into it, takes over the party, and reclaims his fiance. Push makes Gwawl promise to leave him and Rhiannon alone, and the happy couple are properly married without incident. No, the next incident comes a few years later, when after having gone childish for long enough that people are starting to talk, Rhiannon gets pregnant and has a son. This is great news, but that night, the maids guarding the baby fall asleep, and when they wake up, the baby's gone. Panicked at the thought of having to admit that they lost the royal baby, the maids conclude that the only sane solution is to frame Rhiannon for infanticide and claim she ate the baby. 
Shannon is rightly livid at the accusation, but unfortunately the baby is gone, which is a pretty bad sign for her I didn't eat the damn baby claim. There's an uproar and Push is once again urged to divorce her and marry a less controversial queen, to which Push responds with, the only reason you a-holes could give for me to divorce my wife was that she hadn't had a kid. She's had a kid, so she's still my wife. And that's the end of that. But despite still being the queen and all, Rhiannon is ordered to do seven years of penance for eating the baby, which entails her sitting by the city gates and telling anyone new in town the story of how she totally ate her baby, and then she also has to offer to carry them wherever they're going. But if you were wondering where the baby actually went, we cut to a convenient childless couple. There are so many in stories like these. That, due to a series of complicated shenanigans involving a horse-killing monster, wind up with a mysterious baby on their doorstep. The couple in question is composed of the horse lord Tiernan and his wife, and they react to the mysterious doorstep baby the same way all fictional childless couples do, and immediately take him in and raise him as their own. The child grows supernaturally fast and also gets along really well with their horses, but one day Tiernan hears about Rhiannon and her penance for apparently eating her baby, then he takes a good hard look at his kid, notes a certain family resemblance, and bundles him off to the castle to introduce him to his real parents. So, having solved the mystery of the missing baby after an indeterminate number of years, the kid finally gets a name so I can stop calling him the kid all the time. Rhiannon names him Prideri, which means worry, or concern, or maybe I'm going to strangle those handmaidens for telling everyone I ate you. It's a language of many beautiful complexities. And those are the life and times of the unpronounceable Push, Prince of Deved, because eventually he dies in part one of the Babinogi and wraps up. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to go ice my jaw because I'm pretty sure I sprained something trying to get all those names right. Which I didn't. Rihanna rings like a bell through the night And wouldn't you love to love her Takes to the sky like a bird in flight And who will be her lover All your life you've never seen a Taken by the wind Would you stay if she promised you heaven? Will you ever win? She's like a cat in the dark And then she is the darkness She rules her life like a fine skylark When the sky is starless All your life you've never seen A woman taken by the sky would you stay if she promised you heaven?